like you to look at your hands. Have a good look at them. I want you to stretch them out, make a fist, put them together and give them a squeeze if you feel comfortable. And I want you to have a think about some of the things that you might have done this morning. Getting dressed, making yourself some toast and spreading the bread, picking up some change for the bus or getting your car keys or locking the front door. All of these things so straightforward, you probably didn't even think about them. Pretty simple, easy things to do. Yet if you're someone with active rheumatoid arthritis, each one of these activities is a massive struggle. Rheumatoid arthritis is a condition where the body's defense system that normally fights off bugs such as viruses, give you coughs and colds, it gets confused and it starts attacking your joints, particularly the lining of your joints, the lining of the knuckle joints, the wrist joints, elbow joints. In fact, almost any joint in the body can be affected. And what happens when the body's immune system or the defense system fights against itself is it causes the joint lining to swell, the fingers become stiff, swollen, and painful. And in addition to this, you feel absolutely exhausted because it feels like you've got a really bad bout of flu all the time. It doesn't just cause symptoms though. If untreated, this condition causes permanent disability and damage, which we can see here. In this image, you can see that the person's finger has become, as we call, dislocated, so it's dropped down out of the knuckle joint. And in addition to that, the fingers have started to move over to the side. This person will really struggle to make a pinch grip or a fist. Now, I want you to go back to thinking about those things that you barely thought about doing this morning and imagine trying to do those things without being able to make a pinch or a fist grip. Pretty challenging. The good news is, we have some good tools, some good medicines to try and treat this condition. The thing I didn't tell you though is that rheumatoid arthritis, while we have one name for it, has many different facets in different people. This means that not everyone responds in the same way to the same medicines, which means that it's difficult to know which of our good medicines that we should use first off. Now, when we target treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, they work by just slightly dampening down the body's immune system, the defense system that's gone on an attack against itself. Now we have to be careful, we have to be gentle because we don't want to wipe out the immune system because then a simple cough or cold could be fatal. So we have to be gentle and take it slow. Which means that each treatment takes some time to work. It can take up to six months to know whether or not a treatment is going to work for someone. So, if the first treatment works for you, then you can get some benef benefit within the first few months. But if you have to wait and wait, it's not long before you may well be waiting a couple of years to get relief from your symptoms, all the while knowing that your joints may be becoming damaged irreversibly as well. The other thing I need to tell you is that our treatments don't work in an on-off fashion. So, we don't get a response or no response, we get a spectrum of response. So if we have 100 patients with rheumatoid arthritis, 10 of them will probably not respond at all. 50 of them will get some response, they'll get a little better. Another 30 will get quite a lot better, and then only at about 10 will get really completely better. So how do we try and identify who's going to respond to these medicines first up? Well, researchers tend to look at populations, so large groups of people with rheumatoid arthritis who take treatments, and we try and group them together to try and find common patterns about who responds well and who doesn't respond so well. And then by doing that, we try and predict who will respond well from their treatments first of all. Now that all sounds well and good, but it requires that you can tell the different groups apart. Now in a large population, sometimes it's easy to see the separate group. 
But actually what happens in the real life is that usually there's a little bit of overlap. And that means there's a bit of uncertainty about where you should put your group. In fact, there's usually a fair bit of uncertainty. And in fact, quite often, a lot of uncertainty. Now, this is important because where you put your groups decides who you find within that group, and who's within that group tells you what predicts them being in that group. To give you an example of a sports crowd can sometimes help. So in this crowd, you can clearly see groups of people. They're all together. It's quite clear there are people with red shirts, people with blue shirts, people with white shirts. You could, you could draw a line around those groups. You feel quite confident about where the group starts and finishes. And this is an ideal scenario. So you can then look at those groups and say, what, what's the common about the people with white shirts? They support one team, or blue shirts support another team? What usually happens, though, in research, is a bit more like this. It's really difficult to see where the groups are. There are some groups within there, because they used to be up in the stands. They've now gone onto the pitch. Now, so there are groups in there, but it's really difficult to tell exactly where they are. The other thing to be aware of is about when you look. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had these when you were younger, a, a sort of a flip book where you could flip through and you could see the pattern emerge as you flip through the pages of the flip book. Now, what this tells us is that when we're measuring how well someone does, rheumatoid arthritis continues over time. It doesn't just stop at six months. It doesn't just stop at 12 months. It's there all the time. And it fluctuates. So it gets better and it gets worse from day to day. But when you do a research study, you need to say, I'm going to look at six months, or I'm going to look at 12 months. I'm going to ask everyone at that time how they're doing. But everyone will be at different phases through their flipbook. So they might be having a good time, going down the hill, everything's great. They might be finding it difficult, going up the hill. And in fact, if you ask them a week or two later, things might be different. And we don't know whether or not there's a happy ending. So I'm going to show you some of the data from a large database that we work on in the United Kingdom. And this database is of about 20,000 people with rheumatoid arthritis who've been taking treatments for their condition. And it's been going for about 15 years. And we ask people every six months how they're doing. And we record that down. And if we put all of that data onto one slide, we can't see a great deal, OK? Whenever you put a slide up like this, people generally go, ooh, I don't know. What does that show? Well, we can see there are some vertical lines. The vertical lines are every six months. That's because we ask people every six months how they're getting on. Some people fill them in a bit early and some people a bit late, which is why you've got that spread of data. And on the side, you can see it's how bad rheumatoid arthritis is. So 10 is really bad. Zero is no symptoms at all. And on the bottom, you can see time. So looking at this, apart from those vertical lines, it's really difficult to see any pattern as such. And the thing is, is when we look at this sort of data, we need to start thinking about groups of people. And we can be helped in understanding this by thinking about starlings, or birds generally. So if you look at one starling, here's a, he looks very happy sitting there, but we can't tell a lot about what's going on. We can tell a lot about him as an individual, but not as the group as a whole. In fact, if we look at a few on a line, we can still not really see much in the way of patterns. It's not until we, group, we really zoom out that we can see that there's a group of starlings. There are a couple of hundred starlings there. I don't know if ever you've seen on a summer's evening walking home, groups of birds like this swarming around. It's absolutely fantastic. If you zoom in on that group, you don't see the real patterns. You don't see what's going on. It's not until you step back. In fact, sometimes you can see that there are two groups. Or is it one group? In this case, it's two groups. But if we look back at that image again, we can see that now there probably are two groups and they're overlapping. So we can use our knowledge to actually find new patterns within the data. Now, this means that instead of trying to say, well, let's look at things just at six months and say, how are you doing at six months? We can start saying, should we have a look at people in real time, over time, and try and understand trajectories of how people do? 
How do people do in the real time over the long haul? So let's look back at that slide again. Still, we can still see the slides uh, with the lines, the vertical lines. It's not fabulously clear. But if we ask the computer to say, can you split that out into groups? We see something interesting. The computer will join everyone's data points dot to dot. So there are people here that will have one, every, one data point every six months or so, and it joins them together, and then it splits them out into some groups that it can see. And what it sees is it starts seeing that there are patterns within the data. So previously you couldn't see really very much at all. But now we can see that there seems to be at the top a group of people who are, continue to not do very well, and at the bottom a group of people that seem to do really well. This is still a really difficult slide to see exactly what's going on, so let's ask it to clean it up a little bit more. And we can see that there are now four groups of people that split out. And they split out pretty early. They split out, actually, you can start telling the difference at about one or two months. Now what's really exciting is that we can now look at those different lines and we can trace it back to the beginning, to before anyone has taken their medicine. And we can say, what's different between these groups? What is different between someone who's going to go on the top line and someone who's going to go on the bottom line? Because if you go on the bottom line, you can do really well, and that's a good treatment for you. If you're on the top line, the treatment's not probably that great for you. And we can see that there are some common patterns. People, there are many different things that we've seen, but some of the things that we've seen is people who are more overweight seem to not do so well. People who smoke don't do so well. And women don't seem to do as well generally with treatments as do men. And we don't know why. And if you're thinner, you also seem to do better. So we're right at the beginning here. This is one database for one drug set. But there are many different databases out there. And we're starting to be able to link these together. And with the computing power that we have now, we can start seeing new patterns within those data. We can start seeing new flocks of starlings, where we previously saw one, we can see two. And we can start being able to predict things much better. So that we can go from only having 10% or 10 in 100 people doing well, to having everyone doing well first time. Your hands are the most amazing tools that you have. And it's really important that we stop this from happening. And I believe we can stop this and we are seeing less of this. We want to stop the damage and disability and protect, protect our hands from when we're young to when we're old. Thank you.